Hello, students. Welcome back to our final episode in Chapter 8, looking at costs in the long run. So the big difference between the long run and the short run is that firms have extra flexibility in the long run. In particular, their fixed costs go away. Here's an example that illustrates that idea. So maybe in the short run, you've got a one-year contract where you're renting out a storefront in the mall and you got to pay your rent every month, whether or not you produce anything and whether or not you sell anything. So that cost for you in the short run is a fixed cost. In the long run though, that contract eventually expires and now you're not forced to keep paying rent after the contract expires. You could choose to not rent there anymore. So that fixed cost goes away once that contract expires in the long run. We have a lot of abbreviations in this chapter, so now we're gonna add two more. SRATC is short run average total cost. Similarly, LRATC is long run average total cost. Now because the firm has extra flexibility in the long run, it's not compelled to renew those contracts for its rent. The long run total average total costs are never going to be above the short run costs. So at best, the short run costs can equal long run costs if renewing that contract is still in the firm's best interest. If it's not, then the firm has less flexible in the short run and higher costs and lower costs in the long run. So it could look something like this. So the blue line here is long run average total costs. And you have these two short run average total cost curves as well. So this point here, it turns out that just renewing all those contracts has in the short run is still a good idea in the long run. So short run costs and average costs are the same. At these other points though, the firm really is hurt by the lack of flexibility in the short run. Similar for this curve over here. So at this particular point, all the firm's contracts in the short run are the best. So the firm would keep doing that in the long run and long run short run costs are the same. For the other points in the curve though, the firm would really like that the flexibility uh, being able to change contracts in the long run has higher costs in the short run. So we say that we have economies of scale if long run average costs fall when quantity rises. So that could look something like this. So your average total cost per unit go down as you produce more and more units. There are several ways that this could arise. Bigger companies can often negotiate special discounts for themselves. So it's well known that Amazon has a deal with the post office. Amazon provides the post office with a lot of business. So they were able to negotiate a discounted rate for shipping compared to what the rest of us pay. Walmart can also get discounts from its suppliers. They sell a tremendous amount of stuff. So even if you're making a smaller profit per unit on what you sell at Walmart, Walmart helps you sell so much stuff overall that it still could be a good idea to let them have a discount. It's similar for the post office so and Amazon. Amazon doesn't have to use the post office. They could use um, UPS or some other private company. If the post office enters a contract with Amazon with this discount, they're making less money per package. However, Amazon gives them so many packages that the post office probably benefits from it overall. So would you rather make, for example, $1 per package on a million packages 
Or would you rather make $2 per package on 10,000 packages? It's better to make a smaller profit per package and get a lot more packages because of Amazon than is to take the other one. So offering a discount to a big, to a big firm could be beneficial to both sides. So Amazon and the post office could both benefit from this deal. Similarly, Walmart and suppliers could also both benefit from these discounts. And that can help out consumers as well. So because Walmart gets discounts from its suppliers, it can offer very low prices. Similarly, Amazon can charge less for shipping to its customers because they get this deal with the post office. So the benefits flow to consumers as well. Now, not all companies have economies of scale. There's also the opposite, which is called diseconomies of scale. That means that your long run average costs go up when you produce more. Some firms might have a little bit of both. They might have a kind of a scale over some range over here. You can see at this point, the, um, the average total costs are going down as they produce more. But then past some certain point, their average total costs start going up. So partly it comes to scale and then partly dis comes to scale. Potential misconception to watch out for. This point over here might look appealing because that's where average total costs are minimized. That might suggest to you that the firm should produce at that point. Once again, though, that's not necessarily true. You can't make the best decision for the firm by thinking only about the cost side. You also have to reckon with revenue. We'll see in the future chapters how firms make that choice. So don't assume this point is best. Now, how could diseconomies of scale arise in the real world? Well, that's because bigger firms end up having more bureaucracy and that just slows things down and makes things less productive. You guys in this class actually have already seen an example of how bigger institutions have more bureaucracy. I used to teach at Truman State University, a small liberal arts school in Missouri. Class sizes were capped at, um, I think it was no more than, I never had more than 35 students in a class. So because classes were so small, students could email me directly and the email load was manageable. Now, however, I have this gigantic class. I have almost 300 students in total across all my sections. I know if everyone emails me, I'll just get flooded and work won't get done. So now there's an extra layer of bureaucracy. You guys have to email your TAs first, and if they can't resolve it, only then does it go to me. So that extra layer of bureaucracy does slow things down a bit. There is some diseconomies of scale with larger institutions. The efficient scale is where the average total costs are at their lowest point. And once again, don't assume that point is always optimal. It's not. You have to think about revenue as well. Now, your book has some idiosyncratic terminology that I don't recommend you guys using. That's because a lot of other books use the same term to mean something else. Your book says that if long run average total costs are always the same, then the firm has cost and returns of scale. Most books will use a different definition for cost and returns. So everywhere else, cost and returns of scale means that if you double all the firm's inputs, then you also double production. So we saw earlier, if you have like say workers and computers, if you double just workers, you don't get twice the output. Likewise, if you double just computers, you also don't get twice the output. However, if you had double both workers and computers, then maybe output could double. If that were true, then the firm would be said to have constant returns of scale. So usually constant returns of scale refers to doubling production 
when you double inputs. That's not the same as doubling cost. Doubling production, double cost, not always the same thing. So it could be the case, for example, that maybe the wage will have to be higher in order to attract more workers. So you're paying your workers $20 per hour, that might attract some number of workers, but if you want to double your workforce, then you got to draw new workers in, and to draw new workers in, you might have to pay them more. So your wage cost might not be fixed, and your total cost, therefore, could more than double. If I had to pay twice the workers the same wage, that might cost double, but I'm paying them a higher wage to attract new workers, then my wage cost might more than double. So doubling your cost, when you double up, when you double your output, that might not double your cost. So these two definitions are not the same. So that wraps up chapter eight. Be sure to tune in for our next episode in which we'll start chapter nine, looking at perfect competition. In the meantime, take care and stay safe out there.